That's right. What's that sound? That's the sound of the summer season of what? Real talks. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Slurred speech. Slurred slur talks. <laughs> this is Malaika. You might remember her. She was the basically the guinea pig of this whole idea. Um, that was back on the Damon and Joe channel. Right. Welcome to the Damon Dominique channel. Thank you. I'm so glad to be here, Damon. <laughs> now, it was with Malaika that this idea started, um, but back in the day, there was like a little form. What? Back in the day, we used to do this like organically. We'd be with our friends. And now it's all scripted, right? No. <laughs> forgot your line. <laughs> Skirt! This is a clip from the future because we actually got way too into this red wine talk without even really introducing like why, why we're even here together. It's why you're listening to me, of all people. <laughs> so I met Malaika in a club here in Paris. You would watch my channel and I was like, oh, you cool. So let's like talk. And then we started talking and then we got along. So what are you doing in Paris? I'm from New York. I'm from Manhattan, uh, born and bred. I decided I was going to apply to schools outside of the country as well as in, even though I knew I was going to leave the country Yo. because Paris and well, France has always just felt comfortable. So I decided to move to France because my family is actually from Belgium and Ukraine and Chad. Uh, two of those countries are French speaking and I went to French school when I was this high. So it just, it felt comfortable, it felt familiar and I moved to Paris to go to art school. Crazy story. To right? study fashion To study fashion design. design. Of all my friends, you're the youngest. How old am I, Damon? You want to tell him? <laughs> she's 16. I know it's weird. No, I'm kidding. I'm 19. <laughs> and she's been going around like, oh my god, what am I going to do? I'm going to turn That's 20. That's not true. You're going to be 20. I'm, I'm going like, to be old. And I'm like, uh, you know, I'm about to be 29 this year. Like, all right. Yeah. He, wait, earlier we were talking about kids and he was like, like, I feel like in 20 years when I'm 40, I was like, <laughs> when you're 50, when you're 50, when you are 50, you took away a whole 10 years from your age, sir. What I, I still feel like I'm You 18. act like you're 13. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I've been saying this on my channel. The older I get, the younger I feel. Like, and I've asked, I've literally- I know. This is a great question to ask um, your family members who are older than you. Okay, you might be 67, but how old do you feel? And most people in my family answer that they like still feel like 40. I feel like 24, 25. <laughs> no, okay, let's talk about it. Is there anything you feel like when you're with me that's like different? Like, do you ever feel like, oh God, she's like obviously in college or... Uh, I just yeah, there are things that you talk about that I'm like, oh yeah, that's we're like come from different generations a little bit. Like the fact that your friends are on TikTok or the fact that like even the songs are like, you're like this thing, whatever that's called. Whoa. Like, but that's no, like I'm meme culture. That's not who yeah, I am. It's true. I feel that like is. when we're with, with our friends though, and they might not know who, how old I am. First of all, it's always a topic that comes up when we're with our friends, which like used to like make me feel embarrassed. What? What I do? Because you'd always be like, and this bitch is 19. <laughs> and like we have our friends who are like 29, 41, 38. Like all of our friends are old, fucking 50 over here. Um, nope. <laughs> no, it was because I was proud because you can actually like no, I, articulate no, he, your thoughts he was, for once. He was being Damn. very kind. He would be like, can you believe she thinks like this and she's 19? That's a lovely thing to say, of course. But then there'd be that like three whole minutes where our friends would be like. <laughs> <laughs> I almost feel like a poser talking about this subject mm -hmm. because I'm not actually African American. I was, I'm a born American citizen and I am a black woman. So yes, that automatic makes, automatically makes me a black American and African American. Mm -hmm. However, when people say African American and the people who have been fighting this fight for generations, these are people whose families have been there forever, whose families yeah. are African American with all of the history that comes for it. I don't have that because my family's Ukrainian, Belgian, Chadian. So my my black side actually comes from Africa. I'm the first American in any of my in my Ukrainian, Belgian, and African side. I'm the first American. So um, your like black American side is very new. My black American side is new, and it's only me. So and on top of that, the experience I've had I don't think is the stereotypical African American experience. Yeah. I was raised in a primarily European and Eastern European influenced home. Um, there's definitely some African influence, but I was mostly raised by the, the white people in my family. My mother is mixed, a very Ukrainian Belgian woman and pretty French household in some way. So the Americanness that I have comes from just living in America in the most liberal part of America. Um, so the things I, I say and observe are from observations I've picked up and studying American history because it's not a history I inherited. So I feel like speaking on it is a bit like imposter syndrome like yeah i passed for an african-american but you don't actually know that i'm yeah. not you're like you're like the first generation kind right of. i'm a first generation exactly okay i was hanging out with a friend the other day and she said like 
Beach, there were a lot of African Americans in this place. But she was referring to people in Paris, and I was like, they're not African they're not American. Well, African just because they're black doesn't mean that they're African American. French people and most, I think, other European countries do not say uh, Afro French. Some people do it, but like, really, no, like, and. The reason for that, or at least the reason that has been given, is because like you don't have like a black celebration or like how we have Hispanic Day, Puerto Rican Day celebration in okay. the States. They don't have that in France. And the reason given is because we're all French. Like we are all French. On the one hand, I've, I've actually had this battle. On the one hand, I think it's it's cool that Americans choose to say that because you can you can always come from the angle that oh you're celebrating where you're from we're celebrating that you're latino american asian american african american whatever the fuck it's however dangerous. in practice it's actually not something it's for celebrating it's used or it seems to me it's used because they want to make the distinction that sweetie you're not all the way american mm. your family may have been here for 300 years they may have built it on their backs they may have been here first. Stop, stop, they may have been stop. here first but you're not american you know what's messed up say if i were from norway and I set up shop <laughs> yeah. in, my parents were from Norway, but I was born in the States. People would refer to me as American. Ain't nobody American. calling you Norway. -ish. No, always call, no one's calling me like a European American. Nope. And then you show up and they call you, not American, but African American. The fact that people would consider me full on American mm -hmm. and you African American is like, makes, I should be considered either Af, or, wow. Ooh, Damon, you <laughs> wish. You wish. <laughs> I should be considered European American or you should be considered just American. It's something I celebrate. You know this. I'm super proud of where my family's from. I love that we're so multicultural. However, it does leave me feeling a bit like mm, I don't really belong. Like even in my high school, like I was, I just never felt 100% like comfortable, like I fit in, like whatever. It's just, and I think that came down to cultural differences. <laughs> Oh, by the way, since this is the first episode of uh, Summer Red Wine Talks, we're doing them all outside. What? Do you want to explain what we're doing in front of this beautiful chateau? Sure. I don't know. I really enjoy spending my time in the country, which is odd because I'm such a city person. But yeah, moving here, that's what I love to do. And I find that I enjoy it more when Are I you catch sure? You like itching all these mosquito <laughs> bugs? bugs. <laughs> these bugs I'm like about to kill. Yeah. <laughs> This place in particular was a place that we found on Airbnb a few weeks ago. We booked it and it just so happened to be right around the same time that a lot has been happening in the news. Yeah, you know, it, it feels a lot more overwhelming, especially with Instagram and Twitter and Facebook. Even though I don't check anything but Instagram, I felt bombarded with information. And not even information though, it was just a lot of posts and I felt like it was getting messy and aggressive. I don't think you can, or I can't at least, see something like that and then within an hour or a day know exactly what to say and what to post and I really like I was very saddened by the whole thing it's almost like a frenzy like yeah. a media frenzy it really felt that way and a lot of it is in my mind not productive to helping any situation it's all it's just a lot of like noise it's kind of tough because you do of course want people to start discussing the things that have been happening for years it's not like George Floyd was the first black man to find himself unfortunately in this type of situation I think at first people were posting things that I felt were like this is really interesting or this somebody should read this or somebody should watch this because I, I did feel like some of the stuff that was being posted I was like this is really interesting it kind of changed my perspective on one thing or the other but then after three days it was almost like don't post a black square like you're mm -hmm. so stupid for doing this or this isn't helpful just so much critique and nitpicking and policing like I guess I'm kind of doing that now but I don't feel like it's helpful to kind of be on a high horse about what the right way to protest is. Social media isn't new, but I feel like talking about these serious issues on Instagram at least in this way is kind of new. I mean, you don't need to tell someone that what they're doing is stupid or it's one thing to say, hey, this might not be the most helpful thing to post. Like, why don't you check out this? Or, hey, could you not put this hashtag with this post? Because it does block out. Yeah. With that said, I will say I, I the whole thing was I, <laughs> I, like now I, I know what I really think. No. no, I again personally like this is my perspective. I didn't see how posting the black square, the blackout Tuesday was beneficial. Mm -hmm. I I think in terms of like showing solidarity that was great and the initial idea was there, but I don't think it was clear to a lot of people. And I also don't think definitely wasn't clear. Sometimes you want to see what the people are saying on social media 
about a protest that's going on in the states mm -hmm. does that make sense like it kind of felt like i was being blocked out a little bit you from... were being blacked out by black on tuesday yeah a little bit clearly like a, a dumb black square is like not helping it's literally just a square that's black but in my mind i was like oh shit it's a movement to show everyone's support that we're all like marching in solidarity towards one cause mm -hmm. i thought it was like people were trying to make a record like people were trying to make history like the the quickest like accumulating hashtag ever or something whether you posted it or not, i posted it because i thought that was the right thing to do at the time mm -hmm. um okay i posted it let's move on now like let me help in other ways everyone has their own interpretation of how to communicate solidarity i feel you don't need to always police to the extent that i was seeing i already think that the united states has an issue let me let me start this off. <laughs> really? Oh my god, <laughs> he's solved one, it, one guys. Issue. <laughs> Humans have an issue with reactivity. Like instead of ah, but what you said is wrong. Okay, he has these opinions. Like where does this come from? Why is he saying this? Why wouldn't he be saying this? And then responding. And I feel like most people wouldn't do that. Most people would be like one of America's things is that it's a melting pot, and it's there are so many races, cult, like ethnic cultures, cult. There's so many different realities and perspectives. I mean, it's a huge country, and you're, I feel like it's very easy to fall into a bubble of what you know is what's right, almost. Like, people don't think that there are other realities, almost. During coronavirus, mm -hmm. we were seeing all of the people in the Midwest, for example, who were like, this is so silly, like, I don't believe in this, like, it's all a hoax. And oh, at my first, my, my, yeah, my first reaction was like, oh my lord. And then my second reaction was exactly what you just said, like, to their reality. Yeah. When you live in a place like this, completely you're, you're isolated, not a, you're not around other people. Yeah. Then the only place you go is like in your car to drive somewhere. Like you don't really get that there are people in big cities who could easily. I mean, we've been here spread this. three days, and yesterday we found out that they. Were, I think some of the cops were arrested in the George Floyd situation, and because we weren't on our phones and have no access to any news here at all, like to go into the village is a good. 20 minute walk mm. we were like oh wow like in a few days you don't even realize what goes on in the world so i think if people would just before reacting consider every other perspective that they can how do you feel on the whole um peaceful protest versus violent protest thing Ooh, gosh. And, like looting peaceful protesting is obviously the way to go mm. however people like straight up don't listen sometimes mm. Like the black community has been trying to peacefully protest for years and years and years and what do they get? Still racial bullshit, okay? So I can see why there's like anger from the black community. Um, I can see why some peaceful protests turn violent because people are like, you straight up aren't listening. Hello? Let's listen. Well, well, well. Okay, we're gonna like intersplice these clips because after we filmed all day yesterday, one, it was windy. We're gonna blame it on the wind. Not because we were... <laughs> Okay, it was a little windy, but also we just have a few more notes to add. It's not you're not getting it, it's more of you're not hearing me. Hearing. You're not actively listening. Not That's to be a is. therapist, but honestly, actively <laughs> listen. Isn't that what they tell people like in couples therapy? Like, what we need is like a, a Q-tip sponsor <laughs> for people. Like, people need to like clear out those eardrums. <laughs> This is an all of white America. This is that specific group that believes there's no racist issues, even though they're the ones who are racist. Yeah. I feel like for generations, they poke, they poke, they poke, they poke, and black Americans have kind of like kept turning the other cheek. And then once in a while they snap and they have a violent protest. And that's the one time that those white Americans are like, see, see, they're so violent, they're thugs, yeah. look what they do. And it's like- <laughs> Yes, yes, that's exactly, that's exactly oh. what they do. <laughs> <laughs> Very frustrating. So first of all, so you're not, you definitely have selective hearing. That's what we've selective learned. Selective hearing. <laughs> Peaceful marches, a lot of times, what happens? There's always a standoff, something happens, someone's hurt, and then people talk about it. They don't talk about the march, they talk about, oh, someone died at this march. That was for peace, that was for peace. By the way, if you want to know what the march is about, it's for peace, but that's not what's important. This person died, or somebody yeah. was hurt, or a child was tear gassed. It's always, I don't know why, and this, Maybe it's human nature, maybe it's just our news cycles, but they focus on the dramatic and the extreme and the violent. That's what gets people's attention because that's yeah. what shocks people. Ooh, <laughs> freezing. Um, Why are we talking? <laughs> <laughs> Even me commenting on this is like a already like a recipe for people to come for me. If anyone comes for my guy but, right here. <laughs> and then me 
using that disclaimer yeah. is people saying that it's white fragility when I'm just trying to like kind of like I think you're acknowledging ask a you're, question. You're acknowledging that you are a white American and you're given certain privileges. Then you're allowed to have an opinion, and that's the thing. Yeah, you I'm are like, an American hey, citizen. I feel like Americans again don't listen to each other. Yeah, you have a ton of ethnic groups in the states. Okay, for instance, Black Americans have been technically fighting for their rights to be treated as Americans since the since slavery was abolished. It. I feel like things only really ever get, if not moving, our administration's attention. Any administration when white Americans yep. get involved. Oh, you said that. I was like, yeah. Like, yeah. I'm, I'm really, I mean, I hope that doesn't offend anyone. Again, maybe I'm naive. Maybe I'm, maybe that's one perspective and maybe it's not correct. But it seems like a lot of the time, these things, black community knows about all these things. We're yeah. it's not, when we're it not, upsets the white community too, not, then people start paying attention. Exactly. We're not fighting and doing these marches to get other black people to realize there's a problem. We're doing this, I feel like, almost to get white America to realize there's a problem. Because then people take it seriously. Exactly, which shows that to an extent America doesn't <laughs> see its minority citizens as American Valid. citizens yeah. or as at the same level. It, that to me says that, yeah, it's really not that equal. And That's it's, like and proof it's, enough. But like, that's proof don't enough. Fuck. This is literally why nobody wants to speak up. Mm -hmm. Because when you do speak up, people start saying like either... They might be like grateful. Thank you for being on our side. Thank you for being an ally. Or we don't need you to speak up for us. So already there's like, oh, I don't know what to say. And then if you even like address some sort of like, I don't know if I want to speak up, people call it white fragility. So it's like mm -hmm. already saying anything, you're at almost like a risk. And people, then people are like, oh, well, you're making it all about yourself. And it's mm -hmm. like, I'm just, I don't like, I'm just, I don't know how to fit in. I think everything you just said is valid. Like all of those perspectives are completely valid perspectives i think to an extent saying oh that's white fertility yeah because we've seen a certain we've seen that yeah i think people being like we don't need to speak you to speak for us is valid because like yeah. i said we've been doing this since both like since slavery got abolished but i don't think it's necessary to thank thank you thank you because as an american <laughs> as an american that's what you should do you should be advocating for your fellow americans who are not benefiting from the system but i also think yes there's a group that is not very forgiving when opinions are shared from the white community and there's a group that like wants to shut you up I yeah don't know. it's and it is hard like just as i'm i know that having a black experience can be very hard and it has its challenges for sure i'm sure that there are aspects of being a white american especially today when i'm like no <laughs> stop <laughs> no it's been very easy Let's no no no, no, no. i'm sure there are, i'm sure there are aspects to being a white American, I don't know what this donkey call is. Can I finish this thought? Damn! I'm sure there are aspects to being a white American that might be not challenging, but like finger biting, like I don't know how to insert myself in a world where we're starting to be called out on the shit we've done, on the shit we benefit from. How do I be an ally without stepping on someone's toes? How do I speak my opinion from my reality? And I think that's the thing, when there are white Americans and I'm not even talking about the bigots. I'm talking about the people who are just like, oh, I feel like looting is really an extreme thing to do. People are like, white fragility, wow, you're so unaware. Yeah, that's definitely one unaware perspective to look at, like I said. You're kind of putting property over human life, but at the same time, you're invalidating their perspective. And like it or not, this person is part of this country. And they truly, I mean, give people a second to say what's on their mind or to say speak it and work it out listen to them and if it's extreme of course correct them try to like have a dialogue though that's the thing it's not a, it's never a dialogue it's always a critique and a extremely yeah, it is. aggressive very debate critique. there's so much political correctness to the point where you cannot say anything without advocating the other side like you're always sidestepping what you're saying anybody saying anything in 2020 you have to add a disclaimer because people think that if you're talking about this thing, you're ta you're taking away something from the other side, which is like that's not. We're just talking about this. It's like thing. can can I, let me finish my thought about this and then I'll address <laughs> that I recognize this. I get where it comes from. Like of course the political correctness, the wanting to acknowledge every side. I think that's important because you need to have a full frame picture. You need to realize everything. But like let me get this first bit out before you stop watching and just say that like. Yeah, you know, whatever your opinion is. Because to me, as an, as a listener, an active listener, that should already be implied that the person, okay, they're saying one thing, but stop trying to find a double meaning on like how they're 
diss on the other yeah. side. For example, if I was with a group of straight people and like I wanted to make everybody go to the gay club or something, I don't know, and they're like, oh, well, not really my scene. They, in my mind, don't need to add a disclaimer like, it's not that I don't support gay rights, it's just I don't want to go there. Some people might be like, oh, you don't want to go to the gay bar? What? What's wrong with the gay bar? And I feel that's the where we're at in society. People are so ready to fight. Ready to like just find anything wrong with what when that's not their intent. They just do not want to go to the gay bar. On a low though, I feel like that's somewhat justifiable. That like not aggression, but where that comes from, because there are a ton of people who that's why they, it's not their scene. You're just taking it out on the wrong people. Like, you know, I guess maybe kind of learn how to taking read. taking it out on the wrong people. Right. You're like learn how to read the room, know who your audience is, know who you're with. Um, and I feel like statements like that towards if you know who you're talking to aren't necessary. You can sense when someone's coming from a bigoted place. It's not that hard to tell. Like, you've already made up your mind yeah. whether you're going to like somebody or dislike yeah. them based on, like, what you are bringing to the table. Exactly. Let's say, for example, in Paris, in the third, or in the Marais. Yeah. The Marais is very much a gay community. Yeah, and fact. for someone to come in that arrondissement, in that exact place, and be like, I'm uncomfortable, to say it to a friend, don't invalidate how they're feeling, but at the same time, yes, have a dialogue. Be like, well, this is how you feel in one section of the city, of one section of the country that we get to be ourselves. Imagine how yeah. we feel everywhere else. That's not invalidating them. That's explain that's giving them a perspective that they're not seeing. And I feel yep. like if the dialogue was more <laughs> about seeing perspectives, I think I'm gonna say perspective fifty thousand times in this video. Perspective. <laughs> perspective and dialogue. Perspective and dialogue. <laughs> Let me look at your environment that you're in or the people you're surrounded by or the lifestyle you lead or the economic status you stand in in which country which religion which what like there's always a reason to why and even if you don't agree with it it's so important to acknowledge and take it into account you can't run your country based on one person one group's views or whatever that's absurd especially in a country as huge as the usa you and you don't always need to share what's on your mind quite frankly. i know that like i'm coming onto your channel sharing what's on my mind that's but really you've asked important to me say. you've asked me yeah i don't think that everyone needs to tweet everything they're thinking in the second i don't think somebody needs to dm a celebrity or an influencer or an artist everything they're thinking or why they think this is wrong without any actual um context any driving argument that has facts backing it up you know this new generation or new society of social media and everyone like seeing what everyone's doing online it gives us whether we know it or not it makes us feel like we have the right to people's time mm -hmm. like if you share everything on instagram story all the time and you don't share it the next day then like where are you at like why are you being so silent and so we get accustomed to like thinking we're entitled to other people's time for many people i don't think that they think that they're racist mm -hmm. Mm -hmm but they fail to recognize that the system is still like pretty racist, yeah. systemic racism. Like they may not see anything wrong with this person and this person, but They're I don't- They're participating in the system. Like they don't really realize how the system is still like oppressing certain minority groups. Yeah, <laughs> all of them. <laughs> if you go walking around a certain, like there are certain parts of cities where like you don't want to go um, because white people think that the black people live there and then it's going to be more dangerous. Like that's still a form of racism. Whenever they call it an up and coming neighborhood, it's because gentrification's up on its way. Like ugh. certain high schools, the high schools that don't receive as much funding tend to be the black high schools because their property values are undervalued. Mm -hmm by people in power who tend to be the white people. Okay, so, so I was always told my whole life, which honestly is so irritating to me, um, oh, well you you don't sound black, um, you, you talk white, which like, how are you gonna sound like a color, but okay. I, mean, I think it bothers me because saying that someone talks like a white person is implying that, because by I feel like our society standards, the way white people speak is the correct or educated way to speak. So by saying, that somebody doesn't sound like a black person is saying, oh, you sound educated, which kind of seems like you're saying people of color aren't able to articulate anything. There was another example when Miley Cyrus did, she like started twerking on stage with I think Robin Thicke. Oh my Thicke. God, yeah. But before that, like everyone who had twerked before, like- it Was ghetto. Was, yeah, it, was, it wasn't cool, it was like gross. Oh, like, so labeling you... anything that's um, black American culture as ratchet or ghetto. <laughs> I don't need to add anything onto that. Just like- Just that was that. Just that. You got it. But the buzz around it created this conversation where now 
Like, if you go to a dance floor, what is everyone doing? They're twerking. Like, Again, what did you say in the other portion of the same video? Things only start changing when you, like, have the white, white community involved, who, yeah. like, start bringing it up. Then the, then the rest of every, all the white people are like, oh, yeah, we can do that. Yeah. Everything around us influences how we think. The news sources that you get, everything is slightly biased one way or the other, and it's shaped by the environment that you're in based on the religion that you follow, based on if you're in a city or countryside, whatever. Like, everything that surrounds you influences you. And I was saying that, doesn't that mean on some level, every one of our realities is an illusion? Like, I don't. that might sound like such BS, but what I mean by that isn't that your reality isn't true and valid, it just means that take it out of the context of what you're in and it's... It's like our past is a story we choose to tell ourselves. So yeah. no matter what has happened in the world, you're choosing to believe certain storylines, like whether you believe it this way or this way, we all have chosen which stories we're going to remember. Even the histories of our countries, this is what you were saying this about film. Mm -hmm. When you look at the histories of our countries, we're all taught like one storyline for our country. Yeah. Then you leave your country and you're like, oh shit, y'all have a whole other storyline for this country? Yeah. My favorite class in all of college was Civilisation Américaine, American Civilization from a French Perspective. Yeah. And I was up in that class like, that's not how it happened, uh-uh. And then all I was defensive. like, I got so defensive, but I was a different person back then. I know, then. all defensive, but that's because you were told one thing because your country had treated you well. Like again, like even within one country, yeah. everyone's reality is different. So it's not, it's completely valid if somebody says this country shit or this country is the best thing on earth mm -hmm. because that's what their experiences have been. Like yeah, I'm sure true. the way Japan talks about Hiroshima is from a different angle than the way the Americans talk about it. I'm, I'm sure it is. Wait, can you guys comment below? I've, <laughs> I've heard this so much that um, Americans are so like adamant on the fact that we won the Revolutionary War, I think it was, um, when we got our independence from Britain. That's only because Britain was so preoccupied with the other re the rest of the world. We don't learn that though. We learn like, oh. we conquered Britain, and like, we did this, and Britain's over there like, you guys are just one of like many. Part of that was Americans, or colonists, I guess, were seeing it as the battle. The British, who were preoccupied with other colonies, were like, oh, there's a little rebellion. I don't think they yeah. realized the magnitude of what was going on. I mean, but I'm not a history major, but... Isn't it interesting how it's the same thing that happened but because based on your past, you like it's of more importance or less importance. Yeah. Like, damn. Thank y'all for watching. Uh, this has been Red Wine Talks with Damon and Malaika. Go ahead and follow us on Instagram if you'd like to, if you thought these things were interesting. If you have other things you'd like for any of us to talk about on Red Wine Talks, leave them below. Cause it's what? The summer season. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just so used to doing this. Once uh, again, please be kind in the comments. Sorry, this was also in the same book. Be nicer in the comments. <laughs> this was also in the same book. What people say about you is none of your business. Like, they Facts. could all be talking bad about you or me right now, and we will never know. That's fine. So what does it change that we see what they're saying? Because you're inserting your your opinions in my reality, your opinions about me into my existence. Like, that's mm, yeah. that's the difference. But those things will be said regardless, so really... But it's still, you it, that's being affected by what other people... Well, it seems like they're the ones no, being I'm, affected. No, I'm, I'm on your side, too. <laughs> it seems like, like it they're the ones still, being affected if they get, like, mad. It does still sting, I agree. I'm just like, trying to like, get if, to, like... if someone's going to be mad, let it just be you. Don't, like, make both of us feel a type of way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> let me just like, go about my day. <laughs> Shush. All right. Cool. Three. <laughs> go good. Clown. You a clown. What does this say? Right? I can't even... You got chicken scratch. I was trying Can to read it yesterday. <laughs> Shut up, buddy. <laughs> what? <laughs> you talk a lot. And then, let's go into it. Right? What? <laughs> Any? <laughs> you don't like my turtle voice. Is that what you call it? What do you mean? <laughs> this one over here, with his made up languages and squeaking every, like, <laughs> Sorry, guys. Well, see, there ain't gonna be none of that. What? What? Okay, now I, what? <laughs> now I see what you mean. Oh my god. Your mother is I, Ukrainian. <laughs> my mother's Ukrainian, yeah. Oh, you, you got it. Ukrainian and Ukrainian. My mother's Ukrainian. <laughs> Sorry, I read like <laughs> He talks too much. <laughs> we lost the sun. Talk about summer red wine talks. I don't have many friends who are good at drawing. 
Oh lord. <laughs> and I'm just like, when you go to, okay, when you go to Malika's apartment, oh. she has like a, an actual mannequin in there to like fit clothes and everything because that's what she studies. But you also know, like this is like when you go to one of those like art bookstores and you pick up a coffee table book, there are like all these cool drawings of clothes in there. I and feel like, like you're hyping you know how me to up. Do this. You're hyping me up. And this gonna like look like shit or something. I, he's hyping <laughs> me up. Well, I think this can is, you just please like sure. draw us something? I feel like most people who are creatives are always like, no, it's not good. Um, this is talent. No, no, okay, like take it away now. Don't let them analyze how shit that was. <laughs> film shapes a lot of things in societies and how we perceive them. And even like the perception of film, you can't perceive it as a 100% fact because it's the director's adaptation, the actor's adaptation. You have to think about how this director was shaped in his or her life, where they're from, what their government they live in is like, how they were taught about whatever they're depicting. I've always thought about how, okay, the people who win like the, what is it, the Emmys or the Golden Globes for their performances? <laughs> the Oscars? The Oscars. <laughs> okay, the people who win their awards, it's all dependent on like what take is chosen for the camera. Because mm -hmm. you do a scene like 10 different times yeah. and maybe your best cut was this one, but your actor like fucked the scene up for you. And you could have won the Oscar, but instead this scene was chosen. Mm -hmm. So it's like really your, your accolades are up to the final cut, which isn't always... I just say this because I'm a little bitter because I've been on set sometimes and I'm like, but you cut out my joke. That was yeah, a funny joke. And nobody fair. will ever hear the joke. Yeah, that's totally fair. Or like, I mean, same thing with photo shoots. I'm like, that was a great shot. Why did we not choose that <laughs> shot? Because it's not up to me. It's not um, up to you. Wait, can we just talk about death real quick? Oh my God, 21 <laughs> minutes. Reads 500 pages about death and like, now he wants to Because it was so it. important. It was like, our death is literally the reason why everything in our life matters. Because if we were all immortal, yes. then nothing else would really like give us pleasure in life because there'd be no like circumference to the circle. There would be no end to the things we actually give a look about. Yeah. So death is actually super important. He had this example. Maybe this book was good. But that's assuming that like re that's assuming that you don't believe in like reincarnation. Yeah. Or something totally. like that. Well, yeah. this guy didn't. Okay. Well, there you go. sorry. Go ahead. I was just like. <laughs> oh, this guy didn't. Um, the last part about death that he said, which I thought was super interesting, is it's not so much death that's important. It's that life continues after you. If you are gonna die in thirty days, and then you know that the world's gonna die thirty days after you, your life will still be meaningless because you know everything the whole world's gonna go extinct nothing you do will even matter whereas if you have 30 days to live and everyone else can live after you everything you do still affects everyone else mm -hmm. so it your life still matters mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so it's not so much that our death is what's important it's that people humanity our continues after our legacies yeah he took 230 pages to say that so <laughs>